Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. For us, it all comes down to, is the school an A or a B? Uh, and I think, you know, that is, that is first and foremost what we look for is, does the school have a track record of delivering on strong academic results for kids, regardless of their background? Louisiana adds on to its growing list of public charter schools. But is the expansion creating more controversy with the state's traditional public schools? Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. In a moment, we're gonna check the pulse of public schools and public charter schools and see just how well they're coexisting in our state. But first, on the state we're in, a look at the week's top headlines. Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy is one of four senators who rolled out a last ditch effort to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. Like other efforts, it's expected to face a legislative roadblock. This bill includes a plan that would primarily allocate federal funding for health care in block grants to states. The writers say it gives states more flexibility in health care spending and takes money and power from D.C. and gives it to patients and states, they say. The bill has the support of some prominent Republicans, including Senator John McCain, but it may not have enough support to pass the Senate. At least a dozen children who underwent cardiac surgery at Children's Hospital in New Orleans have come down with a rare surgical site infection. The infection is caused by a type of bacteria commonly found in water and soil. That according to a hospital investigation. The hospital blamed the outbreak on a piece of operating room equipment used to regulate the temperature of patients on bypass. Hospital administrators say those kids affected have been treated and are close to going home. But dozens of other potentially affected patients were urged to undergo an evaluation. Alexandria International Airport is getting almost 18 of $20 million in federal money to invest in infrastructure and upgrades for the airport improvement program. The reasons are twofold, to help facilitate missions associated with the Joint Readiness Training Center at Fort Polk, plus create jobs and improve travel for commercial flights. Airports in Monroe and Vidalia also got some funding to make improvements, especially with runway expansion. Hundreds of cyclists descend upon Alexandria Saturday morning for the 6th annual Latour de Bayou. The event begins at daybreak with a blessing of the bikes at Kent House Plantation. Money raised goes toward the preservation of the French Creole Plantation at 217 years old, central Louisiana's oldest standing structure. It is six different levels of cycling throughout uh, the beautiful grounds of the Kent House and also going through the Kasachi National Forest. Now cyclists can register by calling the number on your screen or by going in person to the Kent House Saturday morning before 7 o'clock. For more info, visit kenthouse.org. Another edition of public charter schools in Louisiana is making news at the same time. A case is tied up in the state Supreme Court that could take money away from some charters. Louisiana already has 150 public charter schools, but they do not all exist in harmony with traditional public schools. At issue is the money needed to educate a child. I took my questions to a teachers union president and a charter school CEO. I used to be a teacher in New Orleans before Katrina okay. and you know I showed up my first day and my principal said don't cause me any problems. And that experience for Chris Meyer was a factor that moved him away from traditional Louisiana public schools. I felt unsupported the team as educators yeah. we weren't How on could the same you feel page. Supported? No and we were on the same page. And our kids now were CEO of New Schools, schools of Baton Rouge his group supports the expansion of public charter schools with proven track records. And he says those involved in leading the schools are on the same page and have the same mission to excel. We are for what is best for our students, and that's all of our students. 
Debbie Moe is president of Louisiana Association of Educators. I am a uh, school teacher. I have uh, taught for 38 years in the classroom in Vermilion Parish. I was a French and English teacher. Under her leadership, LAE and Iberville Parish Schools are involved in the lawsuit now before the state Supreme Court. The suit is against Bessie, the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, and looks at whether certain charter schools should actually count as public schools. LAE argues these particular charters don't meet the definition of being public, even though they get public money. As a taxpayer, I should have some kind of uh, accountability for that money. And the, there should be transparency, both academic and financial. In other words, be able to see how much it is, Correct. where it's going. Correct. And in Louisiana, it's not necessarily like that. Well, I, I think many charter schools um, view themselves as public in that they educate public school children, they receive public money, but they don't always reciprocate with my books are open to the public. If there's a public school or charter school, does the money get squeezed out somewhere where there's everyone's not covered? Well, here's what's great. I mean, in, in Louisiana, you know, kids are, are funded the same whether they're in a traditional public school or they're funded in a public charter school. Mo says that's not always the case, that it creates an air of competition. Is that the way it is now, charter schools no. being a competition? I hate to call it competition, but they are competing, a competing school district. Um, most charter schools do not in any way work with their uh, public school counterparts. All of that seems open for debate. What needs no debate is the decades-long problems afflicting our public schools. It's left parents searching for better public alternatives. If you are a student of color in Baton Rouge attending a public school, over 70% of those kids go to CD or F-rated schools. If you're a white student in public schools, over 80% of those kids go to A and B rated schools. So we have a divide already of, of access to quality options in our community, and that's, that's one of the primary reasons we exist. Meyer says the charter schools he supports make a pledge of excellence to parents that is alluring. Idea Charter Schools of Texas is a brand that will open two schools in Baton Rouge next year. Like Idea, they're saying to families, I promise you, if your kid enrolls in our school, whether at kindergarten, first, second, sixth grade, wherever it is in that continuum, they stay with us all the way through graduation. Your child will have taken 11 AP courses. Your child will follow in the footsteps of the tens of thousands mm -hmm. of other Idea kids in Texas to be in many cases, sometimes the first in your family to go to college, you will graduate from college. I mean, they, these are the promises these schools are making, and that's a very different sort of pitch that, that families are receiving. We don't get that from public schools. Do well, you don't get that traditionally in a lot traditionally of Traditionally from any school. Yeah, right. it's not like there's that level of customer service or, or even investment. Meyer says the IDEA charter has been adopted by local school boards. EBR is increasingly partnering with really successful public charter schools that we've identified, like IDEA, like BASIS. They're adopting them as their own and, and using these partnerships, leveraging these partnerships to go into areas of the community that have been underserved. Charter schools go out and recruit students, encouraging them to look at what they have to offer. But if you're recruiting, that takes money. So where does the money come from to fund that's different than a public school? Yeah, well, we raise you know private uh, philanthropic dollars, so from from local businesses, individuals, uh, from national foundations, uh, and we use those dollars to uh, attract schools and and help them in their startup years. What can we do to fix public schools? I think that there are many things that we can do to fix public schools, although I would say not all of them need to be fixed. I think that, uh, especially in the charter uh, realm, there is more money for the PR um, kind of uh, facet of their existence. There, there is money spent in actually advertising and tooting their own horns. I believe that there is uh, a, a great deal of uh, dissatisfaction, although I think some of it is engineered, with the public schools. Uh, I believe that there are those uh, who believe that uh, the public schools have been a failure, and so they're trying to provide something else in its place. Mo believes some charter schools do have their place, but in her perfect world, only one single school system would operate our public schools. 
a lot of times in public school districts, you know, it's not clear if the dollar follows the kid to that extent exactly to the school level. If you take money out of the public system, or if I take it out of the public system and I place it in a, a charter system, the money that I was using to resource the children in the public system is decreased. A ruling from the state Supreme Court is expected in the next few months. We will keep you informed here on the state we're in. Now from education to a story that has scientists talking and what they're talking about is cannibalism. A team of researchers, including one at LSU, is changing the way scientists think about cannibalism. So LTV's Kelly Spires is here. I'm all ears on this one. That's right, Andre. So they study a virus that affects the fall armyworm, which is a pest. It eats soybeans. While doing their field observations, they discovered something else. The caterpillars eat each other. Brett Eldred is the researcher from LSU. He says this disease called a baccalovirus is so lethal for caterpillars, it's like a natural insecticide. These species specific viruses hit them and if they're at a large enough um, population size, the population actually crashes. When fall armyworms get the disease, it breaks down their insides. The virus starts you know, co-opting the machinery of the caterpillar and producing more and more virus in the very sort of last step is that this virus sort of becomes this sort of gelatinous walking long john deli donut and it literally just splits open or splats on the leaf tissue. You then have more virus on leaves. That's what caterpillars normally eat. And for every one caterpillar that explodes, many get sick. Think about flu outbreaks. Usually it starts with a few people sick and then a whole bunch of other people get sick. The way that flu outbreaks sort of stop are um, the fact that a whole bunch of individuals get infected and then they become better, they recover from the flu. Caterpillars can't recover and they can't get vaccinated. So if there are less caterpillars around, the less likely it is that they will get sick. This is where cannibalism comes in as a good thing. They're weeding out the population to protect themselves. If a healthy caterpillar eats a sick caterpillar, it is the only one that could get sick instead of the hundreds that could get sick from an exploded caterpillar. Science hasn't before considered cannibalism as a good thing for a species. It has recognized some potential benefits. Basically, if you're cannibalistic and you eat somebody of your own kind, you are the perfect meal for the, that individual because you have the same micronutrients. But the risks were considered too great. If um, a fall armyworm eats another fall armyworm, it has a risk of being cannibalized itself, so there's injury. That just didn't fit what Eldred and his team saw happening in nature. And I would go out into the field and I'd see a lot of cannibalism when I brought them back in. So I was like, wait a second, here in this instance, you know, the benefits have to outweigh the risks. For LPB, I'm Kelly Spires. Kelly, thank you. Some interesting stuff there. Today is National POW MIA Recognition Day, September 15th. All of us at LPB continue to recognize and remember our Louisiana brothers and sisters who served valiantly during the Vietnam War. As the war marched on, public perception of the conflict and of the soldiers themselves shifted. But soldiers who called Louisiana home continued to fight and many were captured as prisoners of war. Many Louisiana families still don't know what happened to their loved ones who went off to war. 24 men are still listed as prisoners of war or missing in action. Many other soldiers held captive during the war suffered terrifying conditions. One of them was Murphy Neal Jones, who was tortured after his capture near Hanoi in June 1966. A soldier walked up behind me, stuck his rifle to the back of my head, stood there a couple seconds and pulled the trigger on an empty chamber. What do you think when you think you're going to die? At that point, I really and truly didn't care. I would have welcomed the bullet. I remember thinking, this is a heck of a place to die. I wonder where they're burying me, and I wonder how long it would take my family to find out I'm dead. Jones returned home after spending more than 2,400 days as a prisoner of war. The majority of those days were in the camp known as the Hanoi Hilton. Many soldiers returned home as heroes. Others faced scrutiny. In 
In November 1969, the Cleveland Plain Dealer published photographs of the aftermath of an attack in March the previous year. American soldiers had murdered 504 civilians. Over 40% of the dead were children under 12. Louisiana had several connections to this tragic event and its aftermath. A veteran turned reporter exposed the story and later lived in New Orleans. Another New Orleanian, Congressman F. Edward Hebert, led an investigation. Hugh Thompson was the hero of the story. The helicopter pilot ordered his men to turn their guns against fellow American soldiers to put a stop to the massacre. Thompson moved to South Louisiana after his military career. Trent Angers, a Lafayette author, is Thompson's biographer. His job was to scout for the enemy, and inherent in his job was to fly along the treetops or along the tree lines and to draw fire from the enemy. And then when they would, they would shoot at his chopper, he would peel back, and his cover, which was a Huey helicopter, would come in and just annihilate the enemy. It started off seemingly as a regular operation, it took a little while for Thompson and his crew to comprehend what was going on. They spot this carnage, and they see an irrigation ditch with dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of bodies of dead people. He says, well, how did this, what happened here? They couldn't figure it out at first. Larry Colburn spotted a little group of Vietnamese people running for their lives along the hedgerow. They were heading for a bunker, heading for safety because they were afraid they were going to be killed. And in hot pursuit of them were the men of Charlie Company, led by Lieutenant Stephen Brooks. He set his chopper down between the fleeing civilians and the oncoming soldiers with their M16s locked and loaded. He set the chopper down. He told his gunner, Larry, cover me. I'm going to get these people out of the bunker. If our people open up on us, he said, you take them out. Thompson goes into the bunker. He gets the Vietnamese out. There were 11 people in the bunker. He went back to his base, landed the helicopter, took off his helmet, threw it on the ground, went up to his commanding officer and said, I will not be a part of any operation like this. So the commanding officer then radioed Captain Medina and ordered an immediate ceasefire. The ceasefire went into effect immediately and then and there as a result of Hugh Thompson's courage and anger essentially stopped the My Lai massacre. Thompson would have to show more courage in the aftermath of the attack. The My Lai massacre was covered up by the officers who were involved in, at the higher levels because they knew they would be in deep trouble. It was covered up for 15 months. Americans back home didn't know about the massacre until a veteran who returned to Vietnam as a reporter exposed the cover up. Ron Reidenauer later lived in New Orleans. The chairman of the House Armed Services Committee was Congressman F. Edward Hebert from Louisiana. He, in concert with President Nixon, did not want any American soldier convicted of a war crime. Despite intimidation, Thompson testified against Lieutenant William Kelly, one of the leaders of the massacre. He was found guilty of murdering 22 Vietnamese civilians at My Lai. It wasn't until 30 years after the massacre that Thompson was awarded the Soldier's Medal. That's the United States Army's highest award for bravery, not involving direct contact with the enemy. This segment is part of LPB's documentary, Louisiana Remembers the Vietnam War, which premieres this Sunday night following the Ken Burns documentary, The Vietnam War. This week, LPB had two screenings of the Ken Burns documentary, The Vietnam War, in Baton Rouge and Alexandria. The event in Baton Rouge was held at LPB Studios with the help of local college ROTC programs, Boy Scouts, and area school volunteers. Dinner was provided by our partners at DEMCO. The Alexandria event was held at the VA Healthcare System and was underwritten by the Louisiana Forestry Association. At both screenings, veterans and their loved ones were invited to sign a 20 by 30 foot map of the Vietnam War theater that was generously provided by Lamar Advertising. In Alexandria, LPB also recorded oral histories from central Louisiana area Vietnam veterans. LPB will continue to record veterans' Vietnam stories 
at its Baton Rouge studio each Wednesday. Visit lpb.org slash Vietnam for more details. Now to recap, the Vietnam War premieres Sunday night. This is the Ken Burns special at 7 o'clock on LPB and PBS, followed at 8.30 by Louisiana Remembers the Vietnam War. This special report details our state's contributions and connections to the Vietnam conflict. This past Monday marked the 16th anniversary of 9-11. Under a canopy of bright blue skies, a small, reverent crowd gathered in Baton Rouge to remember the events that shook our country on September 11, 2001. More than a decade and a half has passed since that chaos and confusion and shock. 2,996 lives were lost on that tragic day. Of those, 343 of them were firefighters, 71 law enforcement professionals, and 55 military personnel, all people who regularly gave their time, their efforts, and ultimately their lives in protection of those that they served. So we want to take this opportunity to just say thank you and to thank the members of the military, the members of our law enforcement community, our emergency medical responder community, our firefighter community, the people that put the uniform on every day. The 2017 anniversary date saw the groundbreaking of an addition to the Louisiana Fallen Firefighters Memorial Museum. The addition will house the Spirit of Louisiana Fire Truck, originally a gift from the state to the Big Apple right after 9-11. We had raised enough money here in the state of Louisiana that overdid it and bought other units that they needed. And believe me, I want to tell you this, not a state dollar went into that truck. Not one state dollar, not even a penny. All the money that was raised, and over a million dollars raised to buy that truck and other trucks, and it was all done by the citizens of Louisiana. It's also seen duty during Hurricanes Katrina and Sandy and will now be retired. You can take a look at that memorial at Independence Park in Baton Rouge. Murals and mosaics created by Conrad Albrizio grace many of the state's public buildings. These masterpieces are both beautiful and educational and capture what life was like in years past. LSU art historian Darius Spieth offers insight on this acclaimed talent. Conrad Albrizio was a mid-20th century painter. He uh, kind of reached his peak during the 1930s through the 1950s, really the period of the Second World War and the immediate aftermath of the war. He was a muralist, so he painted um, uh, wall paintings, such as the ones that we see here at uh, Allen Hall at LSU. Uh, stylistically, these frescoes are very, very close to what he did, only that they were painted by his students at LSU in the late uh, 1930s. And so these frescoes actually talk about the arts and sciences on campus and the agricultural aspects of the state of Louisiana, uh, industry and so on. So this was a student project that was done under his supervision. Um, this is what we call true fresco. Uh, it means that uh, you actually have a plastered wall and you just paint on it. There's another method for doing frescoes where you actually have uh, wet plaster and you have the pigments that soak directly into the plasters. One would have to look very, very closely to see the differences between the work of the students and Conrad Albrizio himself because these differences are very subtle and it's a testimonial to the very close collaboration between him and his students. Uh, perhaps the best known example of publicly accessible murals uh, by Conrad Albrizio can be found in the, in the Union Station in, in New Orleans. Now, that dates from 1954, and by this point in time, his style has changed. So these uh, murals are much more Cubist-inspired uh, compared to these that you see here. So they are much more modernist, in a sense, um, and, and very, very colorful. So it's a kind of very colorful, kind of Cubist-inspired work that you have there. frescoes that uh, Albrizio did for the state capitol, for instance, here in Baton Rouge, 
um, that is very consistent with this earlier kind of academic and very figurative style that you also see here, for instance. Now, most artists uh, abandoned uh, figurative art completely. If you look at Jackson Pollock, for instance, he paints an abstract expressionist strip paintings. So he starts out with this very figurative style, gets, gets completely away from it. Um, that's not the case here with Abrizio. This story and many other art stories, you can watch Art Rocks to see them all Friday night at 8.30 and Saturday evening at 5.30, lpb.org slash art rocks. And that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook as well. We end this week now by taking a road trip up to the Smoky Mountains with videographer Rex Q. Fortenberry. Have a great weekend. Be safe, everyone. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you.